Yeah, this is Dan Sullivan. I'm the Vice President of the Council of Georgist Organizations, and I have with me Polly Cleveland and Fred Harrison. Polly is the is an adjunct professor of environmental economics, or, or was, was, was. Um, at Columbia, and Fred Harrison is our uh, probably our most prolific Georgist book writer and video maker. And uh, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Polly to to um, take it from there and to interview Fred. So, Polly, it's all yours. To interview Fred, well, let me introduce him. Uh, Fred, according to his website, Fred Harrison is the director of the London-based Land Research Trust. And from that base, he has been making trouble for the world for, well, as long as, as, long as I've been around making trouble anyway. Uh, uh, author, many YouTubes, uh, general activist, probably the most famous, excuse me, British Georgist around. So it is my pleasure to introduce Fred. And for your reference, he published some of these ideas recently on something called the Evolutionary Blueprint on the Progress and Poverty website. And uh, Sue or somebody can provide the link to that. So I'll just say, welcome, Fred. This is, uh, it is late night or over where you are, but you seem to be full of energy anyway, so take it away. Thanks, Polly. It's still early evening, so uh, no problems. The time has come. That's the title that I've given to the talk. Uh, and by that, I mean we're in a propitious age uh, and it's necessary for the Georgist movement, in my view, to revive our doctrine uh, on a global movement basis. In other words, I think uh, we need to engage very quickly in serious introspection uh, because the opportune time that I believe is looming has arrived even uh, will not last long. Uh, and if we don't grasp it uh, and ride the wave, we'll miss the opportunity uh, what I'm alluding to is the context for the three specific initiatives that uh, I'm going to propose. The context is one that I do not relish discussing. Uh, it's an appalling scenario. It's one that I invoke not in order to scare people, but because I really believe that the events that uh, I'm going to suggest are going to occur, and that it's too late to postpone them, and that what the world needs, our world needs, is a strategy for riding uh, the chaos that's coming with hope rather than despair. If we have to give in to despair, then uh, I'm afraid everyone becomes a loser. But if we can find the tools for uh, elevating hope, then we can negotiate our way through what will be a chaotic period uh, and uh, reach calmer waters um, to rebuild the future of humanity. So the context is this. In my view, the 18-year cycle will continue to its end. House prices will peak in 2026. The end of the cycle is 2028, the depths of the recession. But unlike previous end of 18-year cycles, this one will be a particularly bad economic crisis and associated with it will be three other existential crises. 
Now, we already know that those crises exist, but each one is treated as a separate phenomenon. And what I'm saying is that because of the economic chaos that will unfold at the end of this business cycle, those existential crises will converge, converge on one time. The place is the whole of our earth. We're a globalized society now. No corner of the earth will be immune from what will happen if, as I fear, these four existential crises collide at the same time. The first one is the economic one. Unlike the last one, which was a banking um, phenomenon, financial crisis, uh, where government stepped in with a lot of money and kept them afloat and made people pay for what they did over the next 10 years uh, uh, with what was called austerity, this time it will be the, the governments themselves that will be in deadly trouble. Uh, their indebtedness is such that people won't want their currencies. So how are they going to lend money, uh, expand credit in order to keep the system afloat uh, if people are regarding governments as bankrupt? Politicians won't know how to handle that crisis. Associated with it will be the, the three other crises. One is the migrant crisis. We've already had a taste of that. Uh, food will uh, become short in Africa and South America. Migrants will get on boats. They will climb fences, try to get into Europe, North America on a scale that we haven't seen yet. That's the demographic crisis. Then there's the military crisis, again foreshadowed by what Putin has done in Ukraine, which uh, I fear will then be uh, emulated by China in Taiwan, but not confined to just that one region. Other regions will see violence erupt because autocrats use violence to distract their people to retain power. And under pressure, uh, the military crisis uh, will uh, multiply all over the globe, just as migrants are pouring northwards uh, and governments are unable to cope with the economic crisis. And then there's the environmental crisis. The goals are that we should be dealing with this crisis by 2030, the end of this decade. But distracted by all the other existential crises, the shortage of money and so on, I believe that governments will start abandoning uh, the measures they've already started to put in place, which are inadequate as it is. So we will have many more settlements being swept away by floods, the droughts and the rest. Bring all those four elements, the economic, migrant, military and environmental crises in one intense period and we have serious trouble on a global scale. We know what happens when something like this happens. We can look back in history. And we know that civilizations collapse. Uh, we can date them and see uh, processes like uh, migration. The civilizations of antiquity were subjected to uh, the flow of migrants who they're called the boat people, not much is known about them, but they came down from the west along the Mediterranean into Egypt, into Mesopotamia, and this was associated with the end of the civilizations of antiquity. The migrants were not responsible for the collapse of those civilizations. They were already in the process of collapsing for reasons that uh, 
I described at length in book one of um, uh, my current trilogy, We Are Rent. But uh, it's a good way of dating it. And then classical civilizations collapsed as the, uh, the so-called barbarians came from the north, this time on horseback. They sacked Rome, Athens disappeared, and who's to say that won't happen now again under the pressures that we're uh, even now experiencing? Who would have thought we would be watching nightly uh, the Russian army just pounding, demolishing a whole area of Europe? This is just the beginning of the military crisis. If the Chinese start doing that to Taiwan, and if other autocrats start doing it to their neighbors, we're in a pretty serious situation. Now, uh, this is a terrible scenario, but it offers the reformers a unique opportunity. Here we have to qualify that uh, optimism that I'm wanting to express because I and quite a few of my colleagues uh, like Ted Gortney, Ted Dodson and others experienced this feeling of the time had come with Russia in the 1990s. We thought that here was a real opportunity to reform the system by creating a new social and political paradigm based on the principles of justice. It, it seemed a relatively easy thing to do. The natural resources were already in the public ownership. The people of Russia wanted the free market to be introduced. They needed to invest in new enterprises. The paradigm that fitted that challenge was the Georgist paradigm. We really believed that here was an opportunity on a grand scale to introduce uh, the ideas of beginning with Adam Smith and the physiocrats, Thomas Paine, Henry George, even John Stuart Mill, introduce into Russia the reform, the one reform that would have forestalled the emergence of oligarchs and the pilfering of the public purse. There wouldn't have been these super yachts in the south of France and buying up uh, expensive property in New York and London because all of those activities are funded out of rent. And if the rent was going into the public purse, as we spent 10 years explaining to Russia, the whole of the future of Russia would have been completely different to the one that transpired. Well, unfortunately, there was something at around about that time called the Washington Consensus. And sure enough, the diplomats and the delegates and the think tankers came in from Washington and Brussels and London to advocate the Washington Consensus. Well, that consensus triumphed and we lost. And 20 years later, we can see that the people of Ukraine are losing as well, because Ukraine would not have happened if Boris Yeltsin had adopted what we were advocating during the 1990s. So we have a wonderful record of failure and we need to learn from that failure. And in fact, I've spent the last 20 years doing nothing but thinking about why even in that one place and time where there was no threat to the investors in real estate in the United States or in Europe, we could have succeeded and ought to have succeeded, but we didn't. Why? Why did we fail? And of course, that was a painful experience to conclude 10 years of 
consistent work uh, with having to admit that we just did not succeed in neutralizing the Washington consensus, which was just a new term for uh, capitalist market economics, with no reference to rent seeking, of course, no free riding appears in the definition of the Washington consensus. Uh, why did we fail? So uh, looking back now, uh, 50 years of, in terms of making an impact on the political scene, what is, has been a half century of failure, Yes, as Polly says, lots of books written, lots of videos uh, made, and still more to come. But ultimately, in terms of reaching the people who could change the future of our humanity, we failed. And we can't afford to fail over the next, let's say, 10 years. Uh, because if we do not give people a clear steer over how to negotiate the collision of the four existential crises to which I've referred, there will just be pure desperation and the space will be opened up for people like the successors to Donald Trump uh, and the other autocrats in our world who will exploit those opportunities for their short-term gain at the expense of everybody else. So I would like to just itemize for you for the consideration of the Georgist institutions and those of you who are willing to devote any spare time you may have to thinking about variations on the theme because I'm not giving you the ultimate blueprint. Bear in mind, I have been a failure, right? Uh, true enough, I was inducted into the narrative uh, and the approaches that the Georgists were using back in the 1960s. And I stuck with them for 50 years and the outcome was not a fruitful one. So I can't claim to have the wisdom that tells us how to solve our problem. It, that wisdom may be with some of you who can come up with the ideas that might just work. But I'm going to throw out three uh, concepts or ideas which uh, I hope will get the, the, the discussion going and uh, encourage the Georgia's institutions to become systematic in thinking about what they might do differently in the future, how they may invest in uh, new strategies based on the realization that once the end of the housing cycle does occur, there won't be any time for anybody to take any notice of new ideas because it'll be all men and women for themselves, all hands on deck trying to stop the boats from sinking. So we need to get the thinking done now and the actions started so that come what I'm predicting, I may be wrong about my prediction, of course, you have to judge the realism of what I've been saying. Uh, but if it does transpire, then we need to have invested in new approaches. Okay. The first thing is a linguistic one, and it, it, it relates very, very specifically to the Georgist language. And it's that phrase, land value taxation. The, the whole strategy of Georgism for the last 100 or 150 years has been repeating the mantra, land value taxation because it's fair and it's efficient. Well, the economics of what we're advocating is indeed fair and it is indeed efficient, but that's it. Almost solely it as a strategy for approaching politicians 
and explaining to them, look, we've got a good idea. Why don't you try it? I've done that so many times with members of parliament sitting in their rooms in uh, Westminster. Some of them were willing to say, look, Fred, that sounds a good idea. You show me the votes and I'll support it. Well, it's not my job to convince the electorate to support MPs, but they weren't going to take the risk of uh, promoting a proposal for a tax on the capital gains of the millions of homeowners who regard those capital gains as their, what they regarded as having earned that money. They want to bequeath it to their children or to use it for their pensions. They're not going to entertain another tax. So it's clear to me that the concept or the phrase land value taxation is toxic. It's also flawed. And I've uh, given a hint of the detail of that in an article which uh, you can access uh, after this discussion, uh, where I spell the detail out. Land, take the word land, which we always emphasize. But the rents that we're talking about today in the main are generated not by land, but by society, people working in cooperation, who live in dense urban environments, who invest in the transit systems, law and order and so on, which are the things that generate the rents, the net income. Yes, it's true, land also contributes to the formation of a net income. But if you confine the discussion to talking about land, uh, particularly if we say, but look, it's owned by nobody because it's provided free by nature, this invokes a psychology that goes something like, well, in that case, it's open for grabs. It's available for first comers or might is right. Uh, people looking for an excuse to evade the implications of the policy will grasp the word rent, uh, land and decide that they're just gonna leave things as they are, thank you very much, because they want their capital gains for their pensions or to uh, bequeath to their children. We need to sh uh, drop the word land and land value because of the moral implications. If you switch uh, the debate to, look, the net income is ours collectively. It comes from what we as a society create and the landowners have appropriated our society. Well, now there's a moral uh, dimension to that, which is not so easy to shirk off. Hang on, how can landowners privatize our communities, our societies? They belong to us. Uh, so it's that moral element that just might uh, stir people into thinking a little deeper than they do when we just focus on land. And then land value taxation, the word taxation. Nobody likes taxes and we're advocating a tax. Yes, we say that uh, revenue neutral change, we would abolish certain taxes and just raise the tax on the, the land value. The people who are consulted by the politicians and so on do not introduce that element of uh, revenue neutrality. They just list the problems of only taxing land and end up saying, look, if we abolished um, an income tax, for example, we wouldn't be able to pay for public services. But we haven't just suggested abolishing the, land uh, the income tax. We're saying raise the uh, revenue that's been foregone out of a charge on the rent of land. But the consultants, the, pr the professors, 
the think tankers, they don't play fairly. They're not uh, paid by the rent seekers to give a fair, balanced treatment of what we're advocating. I'm back. Oh, I'm sorry. You're back. My system dropped. Sorry, guys. All right, no problem. Uh, I was in mid flow. What I'm saying is to tell people not, we think we should be taxing your land value, your capital gains, but telling people, look, uh, you should be able to keep what you create. Well, yes, that will resonate with people. And you should just be paying for what you receive. People wouldn't argue with that. When they go to the supermarket, they pay for what they choose to put in their trolley baskets. They understand that concept of paying for what you receive. What they would be paying would be rent, their net income, what they can afford for the services that they wish, wish to access when they choose where to locate their homes or their businesses. So the moral emphasis is shifted away from the concept of the tax. The OECD defines the tax as a impost that you don't have anything to do uh, with. It's arbitrary impost by government in which they take a, a sum of money that is not proportionate to the services that you receive. Now, if you're a very rich guy living in the uh, Kensington and Chelsea area of London, you're paying into the public purse less than what you receive. So you've got a good deal. But for most people, particularly those on low incomes, they are paying more in taxes than the benefits which they get back. They have, they endure a loss. And we should be explaining why that happens to them. It's because they of the tax regime uh, in which they do not pay a sum into the public purse that's proportionate to what they receive. Okay, so uh, what I'm saying is that painful though it would be, I know, I know, I've used the phrase land value tax in all my books. I know it's painful to start trying to shift to the terminology but I believe sincerely that we need to do so. Uh, that's the issue relating to the past. We now come to the present. At present, people ha have no faith in capitalism, no faith in socialism, but they don't know what to believe in. So the nutcases like your Donald Trump comes to the fore and he uses his slogans, make America great again, and he gets away with it. We need a new narrative. Now, I'm trying to produce one uh, in my current trilogy. It's called We Are Rent. We Are Rent. The fabric of human existence in our communities is based on rent. When the landlords take rents, they're taking assets out of our very existence. Now, uh, I may fail in what I'm trying to do. Heather Remoff has tried a, a, another uh, uh, narrative based on gender and Darwin. And others among you may be working on narratives that may be more successful than the one I'm trying to work on. But we need a story of the kind that people can talk about in the pub over a pint of beer uh, and which impels them to think we need to know more about this idea. Where can we find out more technical detail? This sounds exciting. It sounds constructive. It sounds fair. And they're talking over a pint of beer in the pub. It's, in other words, the jargon, the technical equations and so on won't persuade them. But the storyline hopefully will. And we need something new. Henry George succeeded in the uh, late 19th century, even with the, 
the use of the word tax, but he got away with it because 95% of the people were tenants. They were paying taxes to the, uh, they were paying the rents to the landlords and a tax would fall on a handful of people. That's co almost completely reversed now. The majority of us in most countries are in fact landowners and the tax on capital gains from land would fall on us. So how do we overcome the psychology of that situation? It needs a new story, one that goes beyond the one that Henry George was able to tell, uh, one, a story that would resonate with people in the 21st century. Among you, there will be people now thinking about that, writing uh, synopses. Well, you need to help the rest of us by broadcasting your ideas on what the big idea could be, the narrative that might be promoted by the Georgist movement so that we finally access what are otherwise the closed minds of, of the average homeowner. Our fate is now not in the hands of the aristocracy and the big landlords, it's in the hands of the homeowner, the majority. In other words, we've got a democratic problem. The majority are the capital gains people who will seal our fate. And most of us today are among those people, right? I'm one of them. So we need that new narrative and that is the present challenge. And now uh, we come to the future. It's not enough just for us to write our articles, to publish our books, thanks to the friendly uh, cooperation of, in particular, one publisher, Shepherd Walwyn uh, in London, uh, and to talk amongst ourselves. We have got to reach out and mobilize uh, large numbers of people so that they start making their presence felt in the way that, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement does, or Extinction Rebellion. But with the difference, the tactics need to be such that people are attracted by the mass mobilization rather than turned off. Here in the UK, uh, the Black Lives Matter and Extinction Rebellion people do things like blocking streets so that mothers wanting to get their children to school can't do so, or people needing to get to work are prevented from doing so. That creates the bad publicity that militates against the cause of anti-racialism, uh, solving the uh, environmental crisis and so on. So, we need strategies for shock and awe, but what, what form would they take? First of all, uh, the moral challenges. We need strategies for emphasizing the moral issues that would uh, seem fair to people such that they wouldn't dismiss what we're saying. Uh, an example is, look, we need to change the tax regime. Why? Why do you want to change the tax regime? Nobody likes it. Well, in the UK alone, something like 50,000 people die every year prematurely for reasons that have got nothing to do with the way they have behaved during their lives. They, they are dying because of the circumstances imposed on them by the, the tax regime and the privatization of an income called rent, which distorts their lives to the point where, for example, 
baby is born in a town in the north of England called Stockton on Tees, they can be told at birth or their mothers can be told at birth, your child is going to die on average about 12 years earlier than the babies born in Chelsea and Kensington. And it's the same with people in Blackpool. People are dying for no good reason that ultimately they are discriminated against because of the conditions under which government funds public services. Now, the statistics are not uh, secret, they are known. They are known to our prime minister here in Britain, Boris uh, Johnson, who jokes about it. And nobody uh, uh, pulls him up because of it. But the moral content of such an approach, a, a publicity campaign that shifted the focus away from the deadweight losses in statistical terms, for instance, how much extra money we would be able to raise onto issues like babies born today are going to die a dozen years prematurely because of the tax regime. What's that all about? People are going to ask that question. What's that all about? Now you have a conversation going. That's one uh, shift that we need uh, in the way we present our case. Then there are the legal challenges. I'm trying one here in the UK based on my claim that the UN Declaration of Human Rights is a crime against humanity. What? How can the UN's uh, Declaration of Human Rights be a crime against humanity. But when you examine the clauses in uh, that declaration and you see references to property, equality, rule of law, and you deconstruct them properly, they are proposing, they are embedding, reinforcing the circumstances in which tens of thousands of people in a rich country like Britain die prematurely. How can that be a declaration of human rights? I've approached one human rights lawyer asking him whether he would take a pro bono case uh, to uh, the British government, which is drafting a new bill of rights in the first instance to try and explain uh, the deficiencies in this doctrine of human rights in order to try and incorporate the few words that are missing that would result in uh, a humane declaration. If we had associated with rights, for example, the word responsibilities, but no, at the moment responsibilities is seriously missing. If you were responsible for your behavior, then you would be paying for the benefits you received. But at the moment, uh, that word is so submerged, uh, sidelined, that uh, we have a doctrine that actively uh, assists governments in killing its own people. Now that argument, that discourse needs to be played out on a pl public platform, ideally, uh, a submission should be made to the United Nations in New York itself by a respectable lawyer willing to argue the evidence to see how it plays out. In the process of which publicity would be fantastic. There would be lots of uh, uh, experts like Polly and Ed and uh, Ted being invited onto the panels of the CNN and so on, questioned about what the heck is going on? What do you mean by this? And the, the, the narrative starts to get traction and the debate proceeds. We need initiatives of a high profile like that. There will be other ones that you can come up with. The Georgist movement needs to consider 
what action could be taken, cost effective within our means, obviously, but which would uh, hit the headlines uh, and affect the politicians in a way that puts them in the corner. Uh, alleging that the UN Declaration of Human Rights is a crime against humanity, I believe is one such uh, uh, initiative, but we need others and we need to build up a, a whole volume of them uh, so that they come thick and fast. And all the time, people would be asking, well, how do we solve this problem? We solve the problem by restructuring the fiscal system for, and then the debate proceeds uh, uh, to explain the implications. And then my third uh, shock and awe initiative would be against the institutions of governance itself. Our government, the, the democratic institutions are the product of the free riders of old. The mother of parliaments here in Britain was evolved by the rent seekers they designed the institutions and the language and the processes so that people stop talking about the net income that the society produced. And in fact, talked about anything under the sun except rent. Well, uh, there are a variety of issues malfunctionings in the institutions of governance that need to be exposed. I'll just illustrate that, uh, this with that one example. Here in Britain, we are told that the regions of the north are very unproductive compared with the regions in London and the southeast. We who live in the London and the southeast apparently are very creative, innovative, uh, and we produce a heck of a lot of uh, national income compared with those guys up north. How do we base that conclusion? Well, the National Statistics Office has a concept called the gross value added, and they assemble that statistic on a regional basis, and the gross value added for London and for the southeastern regions is double what it is up in the north. So we must be doing something wonderfully well down here compared with those guys up in the north. And so we now have this doctrine of let's level up, let's try and help the poor old northerners to become more productive. The gross value added statistic is a fraud. It's a fraud for this reason. It includes rent as part of the, uh, the value that's added to the national income every year. So if you do that, then the rents that are generated up north, which are sucked into the London Southeastern economy and end up in house prices and other increases in rent yielding assets. This makes it look as though we are supremely productive in London, but they're including a stream of income that is not a value added to the uh, uh, national income. Rent when it is transferred in this way is a transfer income. We transfer the incomes of those who produce it and we give it to those who own the assets that are entitled to claim that added value. So according to the UK government's national statistics, people in London and the Southeast are really productive people, except we're not much more productive than the people who are producing uh, sophisticated cars up in the Northeast of England who for generations have been at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution. They're as productive as we are, but because of the way the market is rigged by the rent-seeking mechanism, the rents are pulled to southeastwards, and they then are included in the statistics 
that apparently imply that we're very productive down in London and the Southeast, and the guys up north are struggling to pay for their public services. This is a fraud, and it's a statistical one, and the National Statistics Office needs to be challenged, and it ought to become a public issue. Well, this is just one example of challenging institutions of governance. There must be so many other uh, ways in which to focus attention on the failures of government, which bring attention back to the source of our problems, which is the maldistribution of the net income. That's my uh, third uh, shock and awe type category. It's something that we all have to discuss. Uh, we need to get our skates on. Mr. Trump won't wait for us. He, he's got his agenda. We have to beat him to what he's trying to do. And he's just one example. Mr. Putin in Moscow is another one. We have to outwit these guys. Otherwise, they will be the ones uh, determining the agenda when things go seriously wrong at the end of this decade and nobody will want to be sit around talking about land value taxation. Over to you, Polly. Ooh. Wow, well, thank, thank you, Fred. That's uh, a, lo a lot of food for thought. Uh, we have some questions here, uh, which I guess I can start with some of the questions here. The first question is uh, from Rami Kutani. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. How can we get land out of the inclusion from capital? It seems we'll need to escape Marx's inclusion of land and to capital in order to allow people to see capital gains, capital gains as gains from objects which are man-made, not things which are of nature but nevertheless still more valuable today than yesterday, merely because there are more people now than them. So well, that's another uh, statistical uh, phenomenon that we need to challenge. Uh, our late colleague, uh, Mason Gaffney did enormous amount of work on this. We just have to hold the agencies that publish the statistics to account in, in direct and very forceful ways by explaining the consequences of uh, embedding uh, land as a subcategory of capital. Uh, we, th there's no mystery about uh, the, the consequences of, the, of that device, what, uh, but we're just not concentrated on strategies that embarrass the people who perpetrate the neoclassical dogma that treats land as if it's another um, subcategory of capital. Okay, continuing. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's. I mean, the, they don't treat capital as a as a. I mean, land as a subcategory. Often, they just ignore it altogether. Sure. Um, here is another one from Tib Tibor Gupa. Have you attempted to persuade the people advocating for the global corporate tax to consider to go for LVT instead? Presumably by rewording it, the question too. Well, uh, the global tax on corporations in relation to, first of all, their tax dodging, and secondly, because of the climate crisis, is an issue. Uh, here in Europe, Hungary has decided to vote against the European initiative on that tax. Hungary is run by an autocrat. Uh, we, yes, we need to shift the basis on which we discuss the uh, global uh, fiscal system, which I call One World Rent, and that's the title of volume three of my current trilogy, One World Rent. The economics of it have to be spelt out along with all of the political, sociological and psychological ramifications. 
but we need to do it. Okay, continuing. Uh, this is from John Burns. It's more like a statement than a question, uh, but I'm sure you can run with it. Uh, LVT is number one, using commonly created wealth to pay for common services. Uh, doing this, we can eliminate income taxes and VAT, keeping all your wages. Most people think land is a capital item like a car or washing machine. To them, it is all theirs. It's getting them to think 180 degrees. New slogans and narrative is clearly needed as Fred say, says, okay, well, he continues, I gave up on ordinary people only targeting academics, people with curious minds. I will give them a copy of Progress and Poverty. And he says, speaking at them cuts no ice. Well, <laughs> that's your experience too. Anyway, go, if you can answer that, I'm not quite sure how to proceed. Well, um, we've been saying that in my lifetime for the last 50 years, we've been using that, that narrative and it has not worked. So please find a variation on the theme. That's what I'm saying. I can't add any more. Okay, let's see. Now I'll, I'll go over to see, what's, see what people have put in chat. Oh, a lot of, lot of conversation going back and forth. Uh, somebody says, I, I, okay, this is just an, okay, a statement from Richard Brayshaw. For anyone's interest, great presentation by Andrew Purvis comparing approaches to taxation in Singapore and UK with primary focus on land and transit systems. Very revealing, there's a, there's a link. Uh, I think, you know, more in England than here in the U.S., though there is some movement for this here in New York of trying to finance transit with taxes on the land next to the transit systems. And that's maybe a little corner of nose under the tent because people do get that. Yes, um, the Singapore example is, is a beautiful one. It, it, it uh, needs to be publicized in ways that are accessible to, uh, as I said earlier, the people in the pub. The, the cost of getting a license to drive on the road in Singapore is quite phenomenal. That's a rent, a pure rent, occupying a highway. Uh, and most people can't afford those licenses, which are sold at auctions. But they don't lose because the huge sums that are pulled in from the licenses uh, are invested in a world-class transit system, which is good not just for getting people around a dense island, but is good for the environment as well. People are happy with it, but uh, we can't just uh, plant that model in the middle of London uh, or New York. Uh, without explaining the, the uh, way it has to be phased in and, and all the ramifications because Singapore, look, we have, a, we have an idiotic prime minister here in Britain who thinks that he can turn London into, he, he wants uh, Singapore on Thames, as he called mm. it. River Thames, Singapore on Thames. He just takes this idea that they're, they're very successful in Singapore and well, why can't we just plonk it in the middle of London? You can't do that. We need uh, forensic analysis to explain how we can learn from Singapore uh, and certainly refine uh, our policies uh, because Singapore uh, offers wonderful insights into uh, the correct way of funding public infrastructure and uh, dealing organically with the related issues like the climate. And they also have an autocratic government. Well, the, that's how it started, but now they have a democratic government. You can get okay. rid of that government if you don't like it. 
Okay, now this is from Justin Reed. Uh, he says, I try and use the public collection of rent in my advocacy, which I first heard from Fred Fulvery. I think it is also underappreciated that the lump sum people pay to buy land is just a private tax. The idea of equality of opportunity is also an extremely popular idea. And historically, the public collection of rent was associated with equalizing opportunity. And more of a statement than a question, but. Yeah, well, and so we need to disentangle all the elements to clean up the way people think about uh, the economy. The ne what's now called a neoclassical economy or model is a bizarre uh, patchwork of ideas uh, built up over several centuries, actually, uh, but most intensively during the last 50, 60 years. And it needs to be disentangled and simplified so that people can see the wood for the trees. As I tried to stress earlier, the narrative we need needs to be one that people can talk about in the pub and feel empathy towards it, can understand, uh, can perceive clarity, which they can't with the bizarre uh, theories that are passed off as economics today. Well, here's another one along the same. This is from Rami Katena. Uh, yes, Justin, I agree. Rawlsian equality of opportunity is the proper next to last step. But then there is also a further extension, which is the universal recognition of the Lockean proviso, which Robert Nozick brought forth. The common ground between these two ideas are explored in, here's an article by Colin R. Fraser. Well, this is not pub talk, but. Well, there you are. Go and look up the source and uh, make what you will of it. Uh, I... Did you? Dan, were you going to say something? I'm just going, oh, the, here's a, in the US, we're told the same thing about China as the South Englanders are told about the north of their island. Okay, there's more discussion here then. Uh, one suggest, this is from Richard Brayshaw. One suggestion, if you are trying to get any traction in the US, please get off the Trump bashing train unless you're going to offset it with the equally valid concerns about Biden and his cronies. Um, comments. Uh, I'm, I'm needless to say, not a big fan of Biden either. But uh, okay, Tyler. I, yeah. Yeah, I, I had some things um, that uh, one was that outside of the immigrant cities of the United States, home ownership was very high in Henry George's time. So I wanted to to challenge that and I wanted to um, I wanted to note that um, the only victories we did have are the ones that Steve Cord and I and Josh Vincent have gotten and we you know because we have local option in Pennsylvania we went to city after city after city and we tried everything and we when we talked about when we talked about community created rent everybody's eyes glazed over they they were ready to accept a tax because they already had a tax and we talked about replacing one tax with another and we never talked about people's homes going down in value because the places that got land value tax their homes remained stable in value where the places that didn't have it their homes inflated in value and then crashed badly in the 18 year cycle so like in the last in the last uh, in the 2008 crash, Pittsburgh had fewer sub uh, we call them underwater mortgages, negative equity mortgages. We had fewer of them than any other city in the United States and fewer foreclosures. So you know the 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 thing that I always say is it doesn't matter what inspires us. what matters is what inspires the decision maker. And the decision maker doesn't have revolutionary fervor. He just has a, a desire to make the voters happier. And the voters got, the homeowners got lower taxes in, 
in uh, in all of the Pennsylvania cities, they got lower taxes under a land value tax than they got under a property tax. So that's what we went with. Yeah, well, the two rate tax in Pennsylvania was an experiment uh, and it needs to be studied for um, its long term implications. Um, I would want to know whether the uh, killing of people, the gun law operation was any lower in Philadelphia because of that than in any other city. Oh, Pittsburgh had the lowest crime rate in the United States as well. When it had, it, it started going to land value tax in 1913 and had very high crime at the time. And by the, by the 1980s, we had the lowest crime rate of the 100 largest cities. What's so, the crime rate now? It's going back up because we lost the land tax in 2000. Is that? Hello, Fred. Oh. I'm sorry, it keeps dropping off and wanting to reboot and update. Anyway, sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Don't worry. We well, anyhow, anyhow, the last, the thing I was saying when when your when your thing froze up was that uh, Pittsburgh had the lowest crime rate in, of the hundred largest cities in the country, and then Polly pointed out, asked what? Oops. Bye, friend. Uh oh. Uh, oh, this is. No, there he is. He's right okay. back again. Well, that was a much shorter break. Um, but then anyhow, Polly, Polly asked about what happened to Pittsburgh after we lost land value tax and the crime rate has been going up. We're still better than average, but we are no longer a, an exceptionally low crime city. Okay, Dan, but uh, that's fine. <laughs> you were, you were, uh, Pittsburgh was collecting a minuscule amount of the rent that was circulating in Pittsburgh at the time. Fine. What a, what, what kind of resilience would Pittsburgh have got faced with the scenario I laid out uh -oh. right at the beginning? Well, does face a 2008 economic crunch, assuming governments are now regarded as bankrupt, assuming that we've not only got Ukraine, but we've also got Taiwan on our hands, Assuming that governments are giving up uh, their goals, their 20, 30 goals on the environment, assuming more boatloads are coming across and hammering uh, at the doors of the United States, climbing over the Texas uh, fences, what would the two rate tax in uh, Pennsylvania do towards all that? Well, it gave Pittsburgh the best recovery in the United States of the 2008 crash. So. I don't know. I mean, when I'm talking to a city councilman, he just wants his city to do better than any other city. And if 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 they do, if they adopt land value tax just as a matter of competing, you get the same results as if you got it because of a a grand vision. Sure. Well, so that the case is to be argued that we should just carry on with the two rate tax. Uh, and, and that's an interesting debate. Oh, let me pick up with some last questions here and then and then I want to I something I want to raise too. but someone Rob Rob Demi wrote in Belgium it is hard to convince members of the Green Party. Oh, somebody said, how about LVT as a green uh, as a green strategy and someone else, Rob says, in Belgium, it is hard to convince members of the Green Party. I must say they are the most open-minded to the LVT, but they still tend to look for reasons and put it on the can't-be-done shelf. Uh, so there's, how about, what, what do you want to add to that or on Green and Georgism? The Greens in the UK are gung-ho for the land tax, land value tax. They bought into it. Uh, we do have a problem. It's a narrative problem, which is people's minds are so flummoxed with all the detail of all the uh, uh, palliatives and all the theories that they're scrambling to try and find uh, specific solutions to specific problems instead of viewing the overall system, systems thinking and understanding that actually what Henry George proposed was 
an organic change to the whole system based on one fiscal strategy. And we're not selling that. People can't see that uh, a fiscal reform organically solves a multitude of sins. And we've got to embed that vision into the new narratives. Let me bring up something I mentioned in the email I sent to you this morning, which is we haven't said anything much about uh, the rents that are generated by non-conventional land sources. And I mean, broadcast licenses, uh, airport landing rights, oil leases, fishing rights. Uh, you know, there's an endless list of property or, or rights generated usually at the federal level. And most of these are in fact thought of as, as a lease from government and patents, copyrights, that kind of thing. And moreover, these particular kinds of entities, authorizations, I hate to call them rights because they're not rights, they're, they're leaseholds, uh, generate a tremendous amount of wealth for the 0.001%. And there's a, a lot of public support for taxing or making the 0.001% pay their fair share. And I wonder if an emphasis on using the language of these people are leaseholders, they are not being made to pay anything like what they should be paying for having the use of these publicly created and supported privileges. Yeah, well, of, of course you're right, um, Polly. These are all variations on the rent theme and, and we need specific concepts to, to identify them. But my point that you picked up on was where I said, look, uh, Adam Smith talked about ground rent and that was fair enough in the 17th century where it was basically an agricultural pre-urban society. But the, the land rent by itself now would not be sufficient. So yes, we need all of the variations like the spectrum rents. Uh, we're, we're allowing the uh, uh, tech guys to make billions, hundreds of billions out of rents of the electromagnetic spectrum. We never hear anybody uh, criticizing them for that. It, the word they resort to is wealth, which conceals both unearned and earned wealth. Uh, we need to uh, start uh, disaggregating the language so that we can talk about the very things that you're referring to, which people are more likely to agree to. Uh, it, uh, Joe Biden, about a week ago, addressing the AFL-CIO, said, put your hands up, those of you who think we have a fair tax system. Well, he knew that everybody uh, would not put their hands up because he, America doesn't have a fair tax system. So the president knows that it's not fair, but who is telling him uh, what a fair tax regime would be? Uh, and, and that's that's the the challenge to get on the CNN talk shows to to pick apart what the Biden administration itself is doing, which is merely reinforcing the unfair tax regime. But you're right, uh, Polly. We, we, uh, Mason Gaffney listed in an exhaustive catalogue a menu of rent yielding assets uh, uh, and it's fabulous but at the moment we're still stuck on land value taxation because it's fair and efficient well let's let's get past but again in terms of engaging the public uh if we can start talking about things as you know government granted privileges or government granted titles and leases just to get people thinking that, that these things are privileges bestowed on Elon Musk for no particular reason other than that he knocked on the right doors and was very persistent. Uh, 
it's a it's a way of getting attention to huge amounts of money being or resources being extracted from the general public uh, by the via the giving out of public privileges. And then, you know, then we don't have to upset people, homeowners worried about their, like my daughter who was upset with her, she pays very high property taxes for a house in a nice neighborhood that provides very good public schools. But as far as she's concerned, it's just too much. So we can forget about the homeowners and just focus on the big rent collectors as a way of getting attention and pointing to a solution. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, well, you say forget about the homeowners. I think that uh, ultimately it's the, the homeowner is the litmus test. If we don't get the votes of the homeowners, we're not gonna get legislation. So somehow we can't forget the homeowner. And your daughter is a classic example of the minds that have to be turned. And that's what I'm saying. We need the language that succeeds in doing that. Otherwise, uh, hey, uh, uh, next time uh, the house prices peak in 2026, uh, the two rate tax towns won't recover faster than the other ones because they will be locked into something that nobody, that uh, all of us in our lifetimes have never experienced before, assuming my prognosis is correct, of course. Well, I, I wonder if, if we aren't getting that crash right now. Remember, if you, if you go over the 18 years cycle, it was disrupted during World War II. I've forgotten in which direction, but whether things are so bad now that they are disrupting the 18 year old cycle because the house, house prices are crashing right now here in the US. Yeah, well, they did in 2005 and uh, the economists were saying, oh, well, it, 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 uh, they endorsed the fact that it was happening then uh, to which I said, no guys, the house prices will recover and keep going through to 2007 and they did. Uh, and that's what will happen now. Uh, governments will panic. They will start pushing out money, uh, even though the inflation rates are what they are, uh, because they will be scared uh, by the implications of not trying to rescue people. And the extra funds that they will be flooding the markets with will, in the main, end up in real estate. That's my view anyway. And so I don't think that the 18 year cycle has been terminated. Well, we, we will have to see. Of course, we're, we're getting crypto is, is going down the drain where it belongs, but an awful lot of innocent young people are getting wiped out in the process. Sure. And, and that's what happened in the dot com bubble when, when it went. Yep. But, so, but that, that, those are incidental to the, the structure of the system. And we're dealing with the structure, not the veneer. Uh, anyway, um, I reckon that's about it from my point. Well, of are there more questions out there? Uh, I'm trying to know what's going on here. Um, do you want me, Paula? Do you want me to read them? There's about uh, eleven questions. Oh, oh, okay. These just came in. I see. Okay, I'm trying to get to get them to pop up where I can see them without. Ah. Can you, if you? I'll I'll start it. If you can catch. Yeah. Oh, hey, um, I'm gonna go back to the first one, which was John Burns. As an angle in the UK, I'm sure other countries as well. Is I, the, did the, I did the first three. You did. You did the first, did the three? first okay. three. and then I moved over to the chat. Okay. All right. Then did you see Charles? Blasington. Charles Baslinton, what about incorporating universal basic income in a tax reform, welfare reform package? This would bring a positive gain for most people and would bring a moral element of fairness involving a sharing of community generated rent and relieving the taxation of creative work. Fred, so there's one for you, whoops. Yeah, well, universal basic income is, um... Um, being uh, 
talked about with approval by a lot of people around the world, including some Georgists. My answer is this. Our world has been so corrupted, so degraded, that we don't have the resources to start the recovery of the moral, the material, the environmental fabric of our, what I call a social galaxy. What is the sense in giving billionaires a basic income when we need that money to invest in what I call the legacy assets, the things that make human beings what we are or ought to be? Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's nice to bribe people with, uh, we'll give you a dollop of money on top of the subsidies that we're already giving you. Uh, my fear is that all that does is uh, further accommodate the process of exploitation and discrimination uh, and just keeps us on track downhill. Well, I would assume that's incorrectly that, wow, this is jumping all over the place, uh, that, that as part of a basic income grant, we would be collecting a great deal more than that back from the billionaires. Um, where are we? You know what? I'm going to move this over to where I can see it. Okay. Um, okay, here is, uh, here is from Heather Ramoff. If we want to reach the people in the pub, wouldn't it be more effective if we started by focusing on the maldistribution wealth that robs the average worker to enrich monopolists. I suggest painting the average homeowner as the victim of theft rather than the one responsible for inequality. So this is from Heather Remoff. Yeah, well, so Heather is um, developing a, a narrative that uh, we have to help her uh, to get traction with and um, Anything the rest of us can do to a sister, we should do. Good for Heather. I'm having trouble getting these questions. To... Okay, something from Richard Brayshaw with all. Oh, no, this uh, we've seen this one. In correcting, the... well, here's from Mike Curtis. Uh, Oh, wait a minute. from Randy Price, in correcting tax policies towards those capital gains in housing that include both land value and houses, do you have any solution to the problem of differing values in different regions, all being subject to the same tax rates in a national income tax? Fixing the income tax treatment of the homeowner's capital gain with national changes in rates or the floor or ceiling has different impacts in different regions. Well, all that that tells us is that the whole tax regime is a mess, unfair, uh, and uh, we need to go back to basics. And uh, that's the only way to equalize, equalize not just what people pay into the public purse, but equalize people's life chances. That's key. We're not just talking about paying dollars and cents into the treasury. We're talking about allowing people to live full lives equal to anybody else. And until we actually undertake the reforms that make that happen, uh, as, a, as a species, we're in deadly trouble. Well, here's from Mike Curtis. I, in my experience, Americans want a savior. What are your thoughts in regard to saviors? Sorry, they want a savior. A savior. Mike Curtis says American people want a savior. What do you think about that? You like Mr. Trump and his MAGA program. <laughs> MAGA or maggots, yeah, right. <laughs> Look, uh, des that's what I was saying at the beginning. When times become desperate, people turn to, out of desperation, the charismatic people, the saviors. Including Henry George. Uh, well, as it happened, uh, a lot of people did turn to Henry George, but not because he was spouting uh, highfalutin um, comments about, you know, that are supernatural and 
or egotistical. He, he, he was talking about hard economics. So he was the exception. Yeah, the danger is that the saviors will be preparing to step forward into the breach. In fact, that's already again starting to happen. The, uh, dem the democratic model is decreasing in popularity across the world and the autocrats and their authoritarian systems are coming to the fore based on the claims of the saviors. Okay, here is one from John Burns. A financial crash is still fresh in the mind. Do people need to be told the system is not fixed and it is imperative to stop boom and bust? Is the solution to pay for public services from land which will stabilize land and hence house prices? Yeah, well, yes, except uh, tax land. See, there's the... Uh, there's that problem that I have with language, taxing the land. Most of the revenue is coming from the rent of society, not land. And so people would empathize more if you said the people who are capturing the rents are actually capturing the fabric of our communities, our societies. In fact, they're capturing our very selves. We think we put slavery behind us, but we are owned by, because the rent that goes into the fabric of human beings invested over generations is being privatized. That's a different narrative rather than pay for it out of the rent of land. But how do you, how do you persuade people that, that the social rent, their rent that they contribute is being sucked away by whom, where, you know, how, how do you, how do you dramatize that? You need a YouTube showing, showing people how their, how their blood is being sucked. Yeah, and that's where the narr new narrative comes in. You tell people in the pub, look, you chose to live in this area and you were willing to pay a, a premium because there's a good school. Why are you paying that premium to an individual who doesn't provide the school or the hospital or the law and order? Where is the sense in you paying that extra premium of rent for those services which are going into someone's private pockets? So now you are taxed on your wages in order to pay for the school, hospital, police uh, service and so on. Well, that's the sort of conversation that people would say, well, yeah, you're right. Why do we pay landowners for something that they don't provide? Well, it's not easy, Polly. We need to boil it down and reshape the stories to tell people. And we need to use the YouTube, yes. We need simple expositions in books, illustrated in, in simple ways, etc. A lot of work and the Georges institutions need to be brainstorming what opportunities they can come up with and, uh, uh, and what they can handle by way of new departures because we have failed in the past. Until we are willing to acknowledge that, we just carry on in the same old way. Wow, let's see. Uh, from Richard Brayshaw, any thoughts about incentivizing companies to set up in rural areas with electricity provided at cost to promote economic activity in these areas? Yeah, we changed the tax regime so that they pay a lot less by moving instead of paying the same tax on their profits, whether they're located in a high value or a low value area. If, they, if all they're paying is the lower rates in low value locations, they'll move there if they're gonna get the same productivity, uh, but keep higher profits because now they're in, their profits are not being taxed. It's actually... Uh, okay, I, I, uh, here, so do we... Do you believe we are in part of a bubble in housing or that this is a permanent shift in relative wealth towards the owners of land and housing? This is from Randy Price. 
well we're in a <laughs> we're in a permanent shift the the um OECD, or maybe it was the United Nations, I forget which, they, they put out the figures to show that the one most valuable asset in the world today is housing. And of course, what is really of value is not the house, but the land. The trends have been going up. Uh, it's a permanent um, uh, direction. It can be rationally explained but standard econ economists do not explain it uh, and it will continue until the whole edifice collapses. That's my point. Oh boy. See, here is something from Akhil and his name, last name has disappeared. Uh, Fred, ancient societies had myths, powerful stories to promote fairness across the community. What such stories might work for the modern society? Well, there you go. Um, the ancient societies had their myths, the classical societies had their philosophies. We are now in the age of science and secular uh, belief systems, and we need to amend the stories, accommodating those elements that were embedded in the ancient myths or the classical philosophies, Transla uh, translate them into the modern language that people can uh, identify with. So the, all th that I'm saying now is we need new narratives that resonate with people today, which are consistent with the functions played by the myths in uh, antiquity, the philosophies that prevailed in Greece and Rome, uh, and which ought to now be informing people, helping to guide them um, to, to the promised land. Holly, you have two questions in the chat. One is um, from the telephone number. That's Kathleen Cummings, who would like to talk. I'll allow her to ask her question, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. I don't I don't see that. When, oh, the chat's over here on the right. I'm sorry. Right. I guess okay, fine. <laughs> Go and then ahead. we're over an hour and a half, so we should take one or two more questions. Okay, let's, let's And then let's, just let people have open conversation. All right, okay. Um, well, with I, regard, yeah, with regard to um, what Fred was saying about uh, paying for what you receive, how would that work out? You see, with taxes, you see it in metrics, you see the measurements but you pay for what you receive. I, I don't quite grasp that notion of, you know, who pays what and what are you receiving? I'd like an answer to that. Well, uh, when you buy a home, you do it on the basis in part uh, that you will have access to public services. If there is an annual rent, as Adam Smith called it, and you paid that annual rent, for the benefit of those services, there is the connection, the direct proportionate collection. Areas with very few services uh, will be uh, valued, uh, regarded in a, in a very low way, and the rents would be much lower than in central London, where the services are in abundance, where the land values, the location values are very high, and where you would pay the annual ground rent which is proportionate to the benefits that you chose to receive. Uh, it's, it, it's not really complex. And it's the same with congestion charging. If you want to go on the highway at peak times and you pay a price commensurate with accessing that uh, time and place, and it's the same with landing slots, if you want to land at Heathrow at peak times, what you pay is commensurate with the value of that landing slot. It's a rent and it's an annual charge or a per use charge. There is no difficulty in formulating uh, the, the charges in the way that uh, Polly said earlier that we can do with all kinds of licenses, fees, charges that are proportionate to the services received and which come out of the net income that we all help to produce. 
Yeah, but in 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 here in this country, uh, people when they own homes, they're paying mortgages on a monthly basis. It's not the same as rent, really. No, and so we we've got to 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 make the transition which can't be done overnight, we have to take into account the fact that mortgages exist, that old people need to be protected, and the rest of it. In other words, a very carefully calibrated program to, to transition to the fair system. Otherwise, we all end up in hell. And that's the choice that I'm, uh, I'm offering. Wow. Uh, in in some uh, and uh, Dan probably knows more than than I do, but in some uh, property tax jurisdictions, the homeowners are allowed to post. Uh, elderly or disabled home homeowners can postpone the tax until they die or um, sell the sell the property. Yeah, and that, Dan, Dan knows more about that probably than I do, but at least that is a mechanism of keeping old people happy. Of course, old people own most of everything anyway, but <laughs> forget that. But that's right. The, the, the reality is this. We are all victims now, just about all of us. And that includes Elon Musk. The rich guys are, are, and the oligarchs in Russia, they, one way or another, they're victims as much as we are. And we need a rational, transitional program to get over this problem. We don't do it with a few cliches, uh, a few uh, simple devices, and it can't be done tomorrow. But we need to prepare, and we don't have much time. That's what I'm trying to stress. I think uh, we're supposed to continue on now with open discussion, Sue, is that correct? That's correct. What we're going to do, Dan and I will be opening this up. Uh, we're going to make all the attendees who wish to stay on. And we're all we're going to make them all panelists and we can have an open discussion. OK. OK. Let, let me thank Fred anyway. This has been very challenging, enlightening, frightening. Uh, however you want to put it. Thank you very much, Fred. You're welcome.